I was thinking this week of one of my favorite memories of when our girls were young. Uh, Riley was five, Reagan was about three, and we took our first trip with them to Washington, D.C. to see all the sights, to celebrate our great country. And I took them to my favorite monument in, in Washington. I love the Jefferson Memorial. Have you been there? Architecturally, it's my favorite. It's beautiful. You have that gorgeous rotunda, and then you have uh, right there the body of water. It's reflecting off of that. Just gorgeous. And you walk into that open air rotunda, and I had Riley with me on, by the hand at five years old, and we looked up at this magnificent central statue, 17 and in some inches tall, uh, bronze of Thomas Jefferson. I said, Riley, do you see that? She said, yeah. I said, do you know who that is? And she said, no. I said, that's Thomas Jefferson. And I said, you know what's great about Thomas Jefferson? She said, no, dad. And so I said, well, let me tell you. So I gave her a little short uh, account of Thomas Jefferson. I said, in fact, he's written some of the great documents that we hold dear in our country. And I said, they're, they're actually carved into the wall there. They're etched in the wall. So we sat down on a bench and I read to her an entire writing of uh, Thomas Jefferson. Poor kid. And I looked at her and I said, Riley, that's what's great about Thomas Jefferson. And she looked at me and she looked up at that statue and she said, besides dad, he was really big. <laughs> she felt like I'd kind of missed the point. You know, I think he'd be famous anyway, dad. Well, I want to talk about Jesus today, but I don't want us to miss the point of why he's so significant. Would you turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 26, Matthew chapter 26, we're in a series asking some of the toughest questions about faith. And it's one thing to be prepared to answer these questions for others, but most importantly, what do you believe about these things? That's what we want to really look at. And, and the question we're looking at today is, is Jesus really God? Just incidentally, at the North Katy campus today, Eric Conley, Pastor Eric Conley is preaching live. I hope you'll continue to pray for him. Uh, uh, Eric is preaching on another question of the faith. It's often known as the theod theodicy, and that is why is there evil and suffering in the world? I, I, I touched on that about three weeks ago, and so we're going to double up, and I challenge you to listen to the podcast of Eric. He's going to challenge the North Katy folks to listen to this one as we look at the deity of Christ. But uh, some of you know, Eric has walked through some really challenging times this last week and a half, and uh, so he really felt as though God was leading him to preach this sermon. I said, Eric, are you sure it's your first time back? And he said, who better to preach on evil and suffering in the world and trusting the Lord than me right now? We can count on the word of God. It's not about emotions or circumstances. And I said, you go. So I believe God's going to use him in a powerful way. You can go to the Kingsland app this week. Make sure you listen to Eric Connolly. Well, uh, most religions have a Messiah concept. That's not unique to us. Did you know that? Uh, there's the Jewish Messiah, of course. That's Jesus, we know. And, and the Muslim Mahdi, the Buddhist Maitreya, the Hindu Kalki, the Zoroastrian Saushant, and of course, the Christian Jesus. So what's different about Jesus? How do we know we have the right one? And more specifically, how can we believe that Jesus is not only a great teacher or leader or prophet, but God himself. Well, one thing that's beyond debate, there is no one else in history like the Lord Jesus. There are very few who don't have something to say about Jesus. You can look at any scholar, any period in history, and people talk about Jesus. He is the unavoidable fact. Very few people uh, would not respect Jesus, at least. You can't find many people, even those who despise the church today, often respect Jesus. But believing that Jesus existed, or even that he was a good man, is not enough. We're compelled to know who he was. And why does it matter? Well, because in order to save us, Jesus had to be God. He had to have the authority to say what he did and do what he said. And you know, billions of people over the last 2,000 years have believed that Jesus is no ordinary man, that he is God himself. And so it's worth asking, how did they come to that conclusion? There are a host of answers to that question we could look at this morning. Miracles, followers, response that people had for him, uh, the, the, the resurrection. We'll look at several of those in the coming weeks. But, uh, but we're going to look at one in particular and one leading into it here. The most obvious answer of why we believe that Jesus is God is this. Jesus said he was God. Now, some of you are thinking, well, Ryan, that's circular reasoning. No, and I'll tell you why. Because you have to ask yourself, if all the religious traditions in the world see Jesus as a great person at least, 
many a holy man, no one calls Jesus a fraud, then that's something, okay? So that's not the case in Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, or Judaism. They all see Jesus as a, a real figure in history who made a great contribution and at least a good man. The text and teachers all see Jesus as at least those things. So to ignore the historic testimony of Jesus himself is to negate not just the Bible, but most of the population in history, do you see? Let me give you an example. You can't say, well, Jesus is, is, a, is a great man, but he's not God, but he said he was God. Some of you have children in elementary school, or you have. Let's say your fourth grader came home from school one day and said, Mom and Dad, I have the greatest teacher in, in English. I mean, I just love him. He, he's been great, and he's made me just fall in love with reading. In fact, I'm going to go to my room right now and just keep reading classics and literature. I just can't get enough. You say, wow, that's really impressive. And he kept coming home talking about how much he's learning from this person. You'd probably even want to write a note to the principal or something. But then he also says, oh, by the way, something else really cool about this guy, he's also God. And, and by the way, he, he's told me he can do miracles and raise the dead. What would you do? You'd say, well, hang on, whoa, uh, you're not going to school tomorrow <laughs> because we're probably going to have a parent-teacher conference with the principal first because this dude is crazy, right? You, you wouldn't say, Oh, well, he's a great teacher and he's also crazy. It would be one or the other. You have to choose. It doesn't make sense to say, oh, he's a great man, but he's also lied about his deity. You see, you have to choose though. And that's why this testimony means a great deal. Jesus claimed to be God. Throughout the Gospel of John, for example, Jesus referred to himself over and over as I am. These statements were clearly referencing the God of the Old Testament. And in case you think, well, that's just what, how you read it. No, that's how they read it too. In John 5, 50, or 8, 58, rather, uh, when the Jewish leaders heard him say, I am, ascribing deity to himself, they picked up stones and they were ready to kill him on the spot. I think they got it. There was no misunderstanding Jesus' testimony. And then our text for today, in his trial, answers, Jesus answers that he is God. And this is the one I really want to hone into, and I'll tell you why in a moment, but he's, he clearly says he's God. Look at Matthew 26, beginning in verse 59, and I'm going to read down to verse 66. Here's what it says. Well, let me just set the setting for you. I hear some pages turning, and I love hearing that sound. So Jesus has been arrested. He's on trial. He's before Caiaphas, the high priest. They have nothing to pin on him. And so now they're grasping at straws, and they decide illogically, if they can just prove that he said he was God, he would be blaspheming. Never mind that they could have considered that he might be saying that because he is God. And so here we are. Verse 59, the chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false testimony against Jesus so they could put him to death. But they could not find any, even though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two who came forward stated, this man said, I can destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. The high priest stood up and said to him, don't you have an answer to what these men are testifying against you? But Jesus kept silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God, tell us if you are the Messiah, the son of God. It's a pretty pointed question. And look at verse 64. You have said it, Jesus told him. But I tell you in the future, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Now, in case you thought that uh, this isn't really what he meant or they didn't understand, no. They were so understanding of his affirmation that the high priest tore his robes in disgust. Look at verse 65. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, he has blasphemed. Why do we still need witnesses? See, now you've heard the blasphemy. What is your decision? They answered, he deserves death. There's no gray area there. Jesus claimed to be God. And I want you to notice something. Jesus was not vague in his claim to be God, but the reason I chose this particular passage is that not only does Jesus claim to be God, but he backs up that claim by pointing out that he is the answer to a prophecy. If you look closely, you'll notice Jesus answered with prophetic words from the Old Testament. Jesus was asked point blank if he's God, and he quoted Daniel 7.13. Here's what Daniel 7.13 says. I continue watching in the night visions, 
And suddenly one like a son of man was coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was escorted before him. Do you see? Jesus is saying, I am, not only on his own authority, but backed up by all the prophecies for Messiah that said exactly how he would come and what would take place. It's a powerful example of the scripture talking about God coming down in human flesh. You see, we can be sure that Jesus is God because he alone is the fulfillment of hundreds of promises that were made about him before he was born. Listen, you can be confident that Jesus is who he claimed to be because of three characteristics of the prophecies of the Old Testament and how they were fulfilled. Can I show those to you? Here's the first characteristics I want you to see about the Old Testament prophecies. I want you to see the specifics of the prophecies that point to Jesus. You see, the prophecies that point to Jesus are undeniably specific. These aren't just general ideas saying, well, this is kind of how it's going to happen. They're very specific. Let me give you an example of a general prophecy. The uh, summer of 1990, I was uh, working with a youth ministry in, uh, in First Baptist Church, Wimberley, Texas. And there was a young lady who was in the church, uh, home from college for the summer, named Lana Askew. She's now my wife. And so I didn't really know her. I hadn't had a conversation with her. But I'm not blind. I mean, I could see beauty across the pews or whatever. And so the last Sunday I'm there, uh, my parents are in town. They take, we go eat after, after the, the service. And Lana was there with her parents eating at the same restaurant. She's coming out where we're coming in. And she came over to me and said, hey, Ryan, I just want you to know I really was blessed by the song you sang this morning. I said, thank you. And we talked for a second. We'll have a great year at TCU. And you go back, have a great year at Mary Harden Baylor. God bless you. Nice to meet you. See you later. And my mom will tell you to this day, I looked at her as Lana was walking off and I said, that's the girl I'm going to marry, which was especially interesting because I was dating another girl at the time. So <laughs> just like, wow. Okay. So, so listen, what I want you to understand is that is a general prophecy, right? I mean, that's, that, it did come true. It was fulfilled, but I wasn't a prophet. I was just, I thought she was really good looking, you know, and I thought, man, that wouldn't, I, I could spend my life with her just after that little conversation. Okay. But this, that's not what I'm talking about here. Some people think, well, of course there are some promises and you can look back in retrospect. That's not what happened here. They're very specific. Let me give you a couple of examples. Out of the over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament made about Messiah, many explicitly pointing to Jesus. Listen, he fulfilled every promise to the last detail. For example, Psalm 22:16 describes a type of crucifixion that was not yet invented until centuries later. And it predicts the dividing up of Jesus' garments, the exact words of his cry of anguish, and the crucifixion. Listen to verse 16. For dogs have surrounded me, a gang of evildoers has closed in on me, they pierced my hands and feet. Listen, David wrote this a thousand years before the birth of Christ, describing the precise manner of death that a future leader would experience, a way unknown at the time, and would remain unknown for another thousand years. Look at Daniel 2.44. In the midst of prophesying of coming kingdoms, Daniel predicts the Medo-Persian Empire, which was yet to be created, by the way. Daniel predicts the Grecian Empire of Alexander the Great, which was yet to be created, by the way. And then he predicts the Roman Empire, of course, yet to be created. And in the midst of that specific prophecy about the Roman Empire... He states the Messiah would come. Listen to this, verse 44. In the days of those kings, the God of the heavens will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, and this kingdom will not be left to another people. It will crush all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, but will itself endure forever. Do you see? So when you hear about Old Testament prophecies, these are not vaguely predicting a son of God will come one day. This prophecy of Daniel predicts the specific historical era of the appearance of some great future leader hundreds of years in advance, in this case, 530 years before Christ. And you could say, well, that could be manipulated. It's sort of like self-fulfilling prophecy. I mean, Jesus could read Isaiah, and then he could come along and step into those. You can't manipulate these prophecies. Think about it. How could you manipulate um, or orchestrate being born in a specific family in a specific city where your parents don't actually live? 
How do you orchestrate your own death, and specifically by crucifixion with two others on your side? How do you orchestrate having executioners gamble for your clothing, which was prophesied in Psalm 22? How do you orchestrate your betrayal? How do you orchestrate having executioners break the legs of the two victims on either side of you, but not your own? How do you orchestrate miracles? How do you orchestrate escaping the grave and appearing after being killed? Folks, it's impossible. Which leads to the next characteristic of the significance of Jesus pointing to prophecy to validate his deity. You see, the prophecies are all incredibly detailed, but put together, they reveal something else. I want you to see that the statistics of the prophecies point to Jesus. The statistics. Here's what I mean. The messianic prophecies are incredibly mathematically convincing. In 2012, in Wichita, Kansas, there was a guy named Bill Isles who bought three lotto tickets at a local supermarket. And he was walking out of the convenience store with a friend, and he shared with him, which is kind of common knowledge, you've heard this before, that the odds of winning the lottery were less than the odds of being struck by lightning. I guess what's ironic about that particular story and the reason it made national news is because later that evening, the dude was actually struck by lightning. And he lived. Now, the better story would be he was struck by lightning and then he won the lottery. But guess what? That's not how life works. He just got struck by lightning, which is why you don't want to play the lottery. Now, here's why I want you to understand that. What are the odds of getting struck by lightning? Very small. What are the odds of getting struck by lightning and winning the lottery in the same day? Pretty much impossible, right? When you have one chance of something happening, the odds are extremely small. But when you have multiple events happening simultaneously, the odds move from unlikely to basically impossible. And when you look at the Old Testament prophecy, you get more than a reasonable likelihood that Jesus was Messiah. I believe you get certainty. Look at it this way. What's the likelihood of a person predicting today the exact city in which the birth of a specific future leader would take place well into the 23rd century? And that's, that's basically what Micah did 700 years before the Messiah. Listen to Micah 5.2. Bethlehem, Ephrathah, you are, among the clans, uh, you are small among the clans of Judah. One will come from you to be ruler over Israel for me. His origin is from antiquity, from ancient times. You catch that? So he's already been. When he's born, he already is. So right away that narrows it down, doesn't it? This is just one prophecy, but it's a very specific one. So what's the scientific probability of that taking place? Well, let's talk about probability for a second. The science of probability attempts to determine the chance that a given event will occur, right? Remember this from school? So if you have 100 marbles and you mark one of the marbles and you put them all in a jar and you shake them up and, and you blindfold somebody and they reach down and grab a marble at random, what are the odds that they're going to come up with the marked marble? One in a hundred. Some of you are afraid to ask all the, all the mathematicians just right away. Said, well, that's a ridiculous example, pastor, right? One in a hundred. So when things happen, you can really assess whether uh, they were likely to happen beforehand. But you can also look backward and say, what, was that on purpose or was that by accident? So if you have that same marble, you put it back and you do that 10 times in a row and they keep grabbing the marble, you say, well, there's something about that marble. They put it in the freezer beforehand or something, Okay. The value and accuracy of the science of probability is well established. Can we agree on that? Well, there's a professor who's now in heaven. He was a professor of science at Westmont College named Peter Stoner. And he wrote a book on this topic and uh, actually became real famous because he was quoted extensively in Evidence That Demands a Verdict by Josh McDowell. But Peter Stoner calculated the probability of one man fulfilling the major prophecies made concerning the Messiah. So go back to Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Jesus is born in Bethlehem. So Dr. Stoner said, well, what are the chances of one person being born in Bethlehem? And he took the average population of Bethlehem from the time of Micah, and then he looked at every uh, era going forward, and all the way up to the 1950s when he made the calculation, and then he looked at the average population of the earth in each of those eras, Right? And so he just looked at the mean, and then he divided the mean, and you had, uh, what the result was, is the, the, uh, the possibility of Jesus being born or Messiah being born at random in Bethlehem was one in 300,000. You see? It's a fairly conservative estimate. But remember the lightning in the lotto. 
when you start to have simultaneously events, it, it gets much less likely to have been circumstance. So Dr. Stoner examined eight different prophecies from the many that Jesus fulfilled. And these are the ones he chose. They're basically rooted in history. They're universally agreed upon. So we look at this. So for example, born in Bethlehem, Micah 5.2, we talked about that. We also saw that a messenger will prepare the way for the Messiah. That's, that's Micah 3.1. So how many leaders in history had someone born before them that rose to power and prominence who said, this is the one, this is Messiah. And so he was very conservative here as well. Said, well, let's say that's one in a thousand of, of great leaders who've had somebody go before him. And then uh, he entered Jerusalem riding on a donkey. That's Zechariah 9.9. 9. Well, how many leaders have done that? Maybe it's likely, but you add that with all these others. Okay, there's, there's others who rode in Jerusalem on a donkey who, who maybe claimed to be a great leader. Uh, number four, he was betrayed by a friend, resulting in wounds to the hands. That's very specific, Zechariah 13, 6. Number five, he was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. That was predicted in Zechariah 11, verse 12. In the very next verse of Zechariah 11, uh, we know that that betrayal money was used to buy a potter's field, which came to be true. So now you start to add these up, okay? Then number seven. The Messiah remained silent while he was accused. That was predicted in Isaiah 53, 7. And finally, just of these eight, the hands and feet of Messiah are pierced in Psalm 22, 6. So Stoner and his students estimated the chance of each one of these conservatively, and they asked, what was the, uh, the, the chance of one man fulfilling all eight of these prophecies? And the answer they came up with was this. One... In 10 to the 17th power. Now, to put this into perspective, 1 in 10 to the 17th power means you have one chance in 1 with 17 zeros. Shoot, I ran out of room. Don't ask me what number it is because uh, there's not a number for that. It's just a lot. 17 zeros. Here's, here's to put it in perspective. For every zero, when you have a power, that's 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10. See? So this would be 1 billion times 100 million. One chance in that. So Dr. Stoner put it this way to illustrate the figure. Let's say you take... 10 to the 17th power silver dollars and you drop them all over the state of Texas, it would blanket the state of Texas two feet deep in silver dollars. And then at random, you drop one silver dollar that's marked specifically in with the other 10 to the 17th power silver dollars. And then somehow you stir it all up. And then you take a blindfold dude and you throw him out of a plane with a parachute first, okay? And he parachutes down somewhere in Texas and he wanders along, around as long as he wants to and picks one silver dollar at random. What would be the odds of him choosing that marked silver dollar? One in 10 to the 17th power. That's the same odds that Jesus came along and fulfilled these eight prophecies that clearly demonstrated that he is God. Do you see that? But that's just eight. That's just eight. Theologian Dr. Alfred Edersheim calculated 456 prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament. One of my mentors, Dr. Harold Wilmington, identified 45 unique prophecies, several repeated for about 80 about the first coming. And in another calculation, Dr. Peter Stoner looked at 48, even though he could have used more, and arrived at another conservative estimate that the probability of 48 prophecies being fulfilled in the one person of Jesus is 1 in 10 to the 157th power. Do you get the point? The point is if you reject Jesus as the Son of God, you're walking away from a fact as ironclad as any in human existence. Unless you propose that the prophecies were written after, which we'll talk about in two weeks when we talk about the, the, the power of the word of God. But you understand that's been obliterated with the Dead Sea Scrolls. Go home and Google the Dead Sea Scrolls. And we understand that some of those theories that hung around for centuries were, were blown up when we found the text from before Christ. 
You can go see them with your own eyes at the Jerusalem or the Israeli Museum today. Which finally leads us to the most important thing about the prophecies regarding Jesus. They reveal even more about Jesus Christ. Watch this. The sacrifice of the prophecies point to Jesus. And here's my point. Throughout the prophecies of the Old Testament, Messiah was not spoken of as someone just coming to rescue his people. That's certainly in view. No. But the Old Testament spoke of Messiah coming to sacrifice himself to rescue his people. There's nothing in it for him. You see, when Jesus cited the Old Testament prophecy revealing that he's God before the Sanhedrin, it helps us understand he knew exactly what he was getting into. He came for you. We, uh, every year we see more and more superhero films come out. Somebody comes and they have some special power and they, the, the world's on the brink of disaster and they come and save the planet, right? And there's something deep within us that longs for a savior. Well, this prophecy helps us understand the significance of the love of Jesus that he showed when he went to the cross because he knew it was coming. My friend, he loved you so much that God the Son was willing to give himself for you on the cross. So I want to read for you one more prophecy from Isaiah chapter 53, verses 5 through 6, that clearly Christ was aware of when he came to earth, when he stood before the Sanhedrin, and yes, when he went to the cross. Here's what it says. But he was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him. We are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We all have turned to our own way, and the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. That passage, written hundreds of years before Christ, predicts his suffering and reconciliation, and he did that for you. So what does this mean? Why does it matter? Three things. First of all, we desperately need the Son of God to save us. There's no other way. And I wonder whether somebody's watching today or you came today and you've never counted on Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I pray that today is that moment. You're not here by accident. You're not watching by accident. Second, we have to accept Jesus all the way. You can't just say he's a good teacher or a servant or a great example. There's no logical middle ground with Jesus. He's either God or he's fraud. And third, it's important to know that the same prophets who predicted the first coming also predicted the second coming of Christ. So we have every reason to anticipate that the other prophecies are true as well. And that means every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Why not do that today? The fact that Jesus is the Son of God, I think, compels us to a decision of faith. Is Jesus God? All evidence points to yes. And if he's God, what would keep you from trusting him today? Let's bow together, church. In just a moment, we're going to sing a song in the courts and also here in the worship center, and we'll have an opportunity to respond. There'll be ministers here to receive you and to pray. There'll likewise be some ministers available on the phone number on your screen. If you're watching uh, online today, I hope you'll call. And I wonder whether there's somebody here who's God's brought in here today uh, providentially so that you could hear that Jesus is who he says he is, and he gave his life for you. And he defeated death by rising from the dead. And you can know him today. You can have a relationship. You can have forgiveness today before you leave this place. I want to encourage you to come when we begin to sing. I know there's also lots of people who have trusted the Lord Jesus for salvation. But the fact still remains, if Jesus is God, is there any reason why you wouldn't trust him with anything else in your life? You really think He would struggle if you hand him the greatest burden that you bear today. And some of you need to do that. So when we begin to sing, you have an opportunity to just place that in the altar of your heart just before the Lord and say, God, I trust you today. You're worthy of my trust. So let's respond as God leads us. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the confidence that you've given us. Yes, it's faith. Yes, it's trust. But it's based on so much great evidence. Lord, we see Jesus as he is today, and I pray that if there's a man or woman who's come today or heard this message who's never trusted you, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our midst. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.